Hey everyone, so I'm just going to do a small update just to show uh, a new feature that I've been working on. Um, still not completely done working on it, but the basic implementation is there. So I'll just show that off real quick and load up the editor. Uh, one thing to notice, um, it doesn't load you straight into the editor anymore. Um, if you just launch the editor, then it's going to bring you up to this prompt screen where you can either select a previous project or you can create a new one. So if you go here, you can show a list of uh, projects that I have that are actually in the project directory. Um, but for now, we're just going to create a new one. So it'll kill that window, goes through the process of compiling everything, generating all the files necessary, generating the project solution, and then pops up our editor with this project actually loaded. You can see it up there. Um, and also, Launches a Visual Studio instance of the project with all the source direct, all the source files. Okay, so that's kind of a newer change. Just kind of working on quality of life type of stuff, trying to get this to where it's uh, much more user friendly and works more in the way that you would kind of expect it to work. So I've removed that creating and loading project stuff up here. So it makes the interface a little nicer, and there's still a lot of stuff with the interface that I'm working on. <clears throat> okay, so let's create a few folders here. Let's create a scene folder. So we're starting from scratch, so I'll just dump a new scene in there. Double click on that, so we've loaded our scene. And we'll need a material folder. And one for the new feature, which is archetypes. Archetypes are my version of Unreal's Blueprints, uh, Unity's Prefabs, and um, they are, for those who don't know, just a really easy way to be able to define templates for specific entity hierarchies and layouts, and then be able to dump a bunch of those into a scene, and without having to go through each individual instance of that particular archetype, you could go to the source, edit that, and then every instance of that archetype should update accordingly uh, within reason. And I'll show some examples of that. So let's create a new one here. You just right click and create a new one, and we'll just call it new archetype. If I double click on that, you'll open up an instance of an archetype editor. So over here it tells you which archetype it is, gives the asset name. And then it gives a, it's a viewport with a different scene in it, has an inspector um, for any of the objects that are inside the archetype, and then it has the outliner for the hierarchy of the archetype. So the way the archetypes are set up is that um, they're a single hierarchy of a collection of entities, much like a scene. Uh, it's very similar to Godot's layout for the way that they do scenes, actually. But they all start with a single empty entity. It just has a name and a transform component on it. Um, it's our root entity, and all entities that will be added to this hierarchy must be um, children of this root entity. Or you could have a single uh, entity hierarchy within an archetype, it just being the root itself. So we can click on this guy. Um, everything works exactly the same way as it does in the main editor here, because the world outliner and the inspector are the exact same view types. So everything should be very familiar. Um, nothing new needs to be learned. So we can create, uh, add a new component to it. So let's add a static mesh component. And we'll give it a cube. And then we could name this guy um, cube archetype. And then we'll save that guy out. And in our scene, it's very simple to create an instance of an archetype. Um, you can just drag and drop and place them in the scene like that. You notice up here in the outliner that the name of this entity is actually highlighted in a, a light blue. Um, just kind of some kind of visual marker to indicate that this thing is different from a normal entity because it is an instance of an archetype. Okay, so this is pretty simple and it's a very a uh, forced example of a use case of why archetypes are useful. But let's say that we have, you know, 
a bunch of these in a scene. So let's go ahead and create a few of them. And I'm just control D and copying and pasting these around. And I've decided that I don't like I don't want this to be a cube archetype anymore. I want they all all to be spheres. Well, it'd be very annoying to go through each every single one and uh, click on these individually and change the mesh out. What I'd like to do instead is come to the definition file and go to this uh, static mesh component and then change out the model. And when I do that, I'll save it, and every single one of these will now update. The way that works is that all the entities have unique identifiers and whenever you instance an archetype the entity that's instance holds uh, a reference to that particular what I'm calling a prototype entity and then looks at that for changes and then does merging of properties for that actually I can show a little bit of that here if I go to my object archiver um, so let's do like uh, merge objects so, uh, we'll make this a little larger, easier to see. So this is the function for merging objects. It's actually very similar to the way that I do all of my serialization. Each object has, um, let's see. So, well, okay, so the merge objects function takes a source object, a destination object, and then a specific merge type. I really wanted it to work kind of like a version control system. Um, and I'll show that in a second, what that means. And basically in this, all you do is just check the classes of the two. If they're not similar, then you can't do any kind of merging on them because it's two distinct classes. So the properties will be different. However, if they are, then what you could do is on the destination, destination object call this function, which is a virtual function called merge with. And what that'll do is it'll look and see if that object has a specific way that it wants to do the merging. Um, entities have a specific override for that. Um, so that gives the user the control to be able to define specific um, merge functionality that they actually want to have. If not, then it does like the serialization mechanism does where it goes to a default and then it does merging based on the merge type and then the um, property type. And the merge type here is whether or not you're going to force accept um, specific properties or if you're going to accept uh, an attempted merge of the properties. So accept source will force all the uh, destination properties to line up to the source properties um, without any merging except destination will do the opposite. It'll merge the destination into the source, um, which is useful for, let's say you made some changes locally on a archetype and a scene and then you wanted to propagate those back. You would do that by doing the accept destination, just doing it backwards. And then accept merge, what this does is that it will attempt to merge the source properties into the destination properties if and only if the uh, property has no local override, which I'll explain what that is here in a second. Um, no local override on the destination object means that you can actually accept the source object's properties. That's basically it, and then it goes through and looks every at individual um, property, and it has a lot of de default functionality for how specific properties need to be merged. Um, and then that's it. It was actually very simple to write because I did it very uh, similarly to the way that I handle all the serialization, um, which is very nice, very easy to extend. Okay, so going back to this, let's see, editor. Okay, so we have all of these instances here. And that works fine. But let's say that locally we actually did want this guy to um, be a cube for whatever reason. So we can change that locally. And you'll notice that some of these properties here are marked in blue and they have um, this little uh, rounded square next to them, this little button. What these are is that they show that they have local overrides on the instances. And what that means is that, uh, again, um, referring back to the merge objects function, um, all the destination objects, whenever they get merged in with the properties from the source objects, will only accept those changes if they do not have local overrides, and that's what this is showing here. So I have a local override, for instance, on this one particular instance of our archetype, and it has a cube as the override. If you hover over that, you can actually see 
the prototype entity, what it's referring to. It'll look at that particular property and show you what the default is. If I click on this, it'll revert it back to whatever the default was. Let's go ahead and change it back just to show this. I'll go ahead and save the scene. And if we go back to our archetype editor, and let's say that we've changed our mind again, and now we want them all to be cylinders, and then we save that out. You'll notice that all these have changed that didn't have the override. The only one that did change, or that did not change, was this guy that had a global override. And this works for most properties. You see the scale there, that'll change. The rotation on it will change as well. If I have something like um, a rigid body component or anything like that, most properties work. There are a few that um, are a little finicky right now, and those mainly have to do with collections. Um, for instance, hash maps, sets, and then vectors. But that's something I'm working on, and it shouldn't be too difficult to get those to work the way that I want them to. Um, they're just a little more involved. But again, so I can change all of this stuff, and if, for instance, I don't like any of these properties, I can revert them back, including the mesh. And so now they all point back to the um, root archetype here. Um, this is not all you can do with archetypes because they actually point back to specific prototype entities and not necessarily the archetypes themselves. It's really easy to do what's called nesting. So let's create a new archetype here and we'll open it up. Now nesting archetypes comes um, with only one caveat. You can't have recursive nesting so I can't include, let's say for instance, in this new archetype one, I can't include an instance of new archetype one in itself because it blows up recursively, infinitely. I also can't include some archetype that includes new archetype one as an instance inside of it. So let's say I created another archetype called archetype two and it had an instance of one. I can't then include archetype two inside of archetype one as an instance. Ignoring that, you can pretty much do whatever you want, however. So let's drag this new archetype in here and what you see here is that we have an instance of that previous archetype inside of our new archetype definition as a child of the root and again like I said these are nestable so let's go ahead and drag this back over here if it'll let me there we go dragging between windows is still a little finicky figuring that out and we'll create another instance and they're stacked on top of each other but if I raise this guy up a little bit and then let's just shrink him down to half I also don't have the transform widget inside of here but that is something I'm planning on doing because just manipulating through um, the editor over here in the inspector can be a little difficult. It's much more convenient to be able to have the transform widget in here. So I need to extend that. Shouldn't be too difficult to do, however. So again, these are instances of this original archetype over here. We have two different instances over here, and you can see that because they're instances and they're pointing back to that prototype entity, they have their own overrides. This guy has uh, an override of 0.5 locally on the scale. Um, I can revert that there, and it'll go back to the original. But let's put it back to what we have. He also has a position override. And let's save that. And so now we can drag out an instance of that archetype. And so we have him in here. And let's move him to the side. And it works exactly the same way. I can drag him up and now I've made a local change. If I revert that, then you'll see that this actually reverts and gets back the local or the default that it had. Notice that it is different, however, from this guy. This particular entity does not point back to the original, even though it is technically an instance, because it's an instance um, through multiple levels of instancing. But really what he's doing is he's pointing back to a specific entity, which is this guy here. So it makes it very convenient to be able to do uh, local overrides and changes and things like that. And again, what's useful about this is because they do receive updates, it's very easy to be able to change 
this base entity, have it propagate through to these guys, and then because these guys change, it'll propagate down to these guys here. And I'll show an instance of that. So let's create a new material. Let's create a new folder. Um, just do the mahogany floor. And I have some textures here. I'll drag those in. Hopefully it's easy to see that some of the workflow is getting faster. That's one thing that I really try to focus on is not that you can just simply do something, but that you can do it as easily and as quickly as possible. I think that's important for any kind of editor, so really focusing on the UX and the UI as much as possible. Um, working on that constantly to make it a, a enjoyable process. So again, we've created this mahogany floor, um, and what I'll do is, let's see, again, this is a little finicky. There we go. So we'll drag it over here, and we'll attach it to this guy. And then if I save this, so you'll notice that these have changed. I don't know why that got updated. Okay, so there's always a little bit of problems here, some bugs, but it's important to notice is that the material for all of these have changed, and they received updates um, through this guy. And again, because these are particular instances, um, we can go through and just like with the scale and make a, um, an override, we can turn it into a sphere instead, we can save that and he'll receive that update. Um, if I go through and then change this to be something like a cube, and then save that, only the ones that didn't have that particular override will change. And that's about it. I know this was kind of short, but that's really just to show off this particular feature set, and I'm continuing to work on it, um, and continue to try to make the editor better. All right, thanks for watching.